All right, get that started. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Scott Bryson. I'm one of the managing editors for the Mitchell Ham Law Review. And tonight uh, we are hosting a panel um, on trauma informed lawyering. Um, and I'm going to kick this off and send it over to Natalie, who will be moderating tonight's panel. Uh, Professor Netzel is a uh, professor here at the law school. And Professor Netzel, take it away. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. And I'm yeah, just so happy to be here with our wonderful guest tonight and think that it's just a wonderful thing that the Law Review is interested in learning more about trauma-informed lawyering. So thanks for being here. Um, our hope tonight is that um, you all will leave with a basic understanding of trauma and how it shows up in our legal systems a recognition of the importance of a trauma-informed approach to the practice of law as a matter of universal precaution, and an understanding of the role that system-constructed burnout uh, plays as it relates to trauma, and then the need for healthy boundaries as a way to reduce harm the systems cause to ourselves and to our clients. Um, and so we're joined by three absolutely fantastic panelists tonight. And I'm going to introduce them each in turn and then um, start with some questions. And if you have questions, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, but also feel free to drop anything in the chat or raise your hand. Um, it looks like we have a small enough group that we can maybe have some engagement during um, during the evening as well. So please don't hesitate to, to speak up if you have a question. All right. So first, uh, we have uh, Kate Diadamo. Um, they are a partner at Reframe Health and Justice, which is a collective of queer people of color working at the intersections of harm reduction, systems change, and healing justice. Kate's background is rooted in community organizing, programming, direct support and advocacy for people in sex trades, and employing other forms of criminalized survival. Kate's current focus in this work is training and technical assistance for service providers, direct political advocacy, and capacity building for community-led initiatives seeking to impact policy change. They are based in Maryland and hold degrees from California State Polytechnic University and the New School. Our second panelist is Hannah Hughes, and she is a second year attorney with a background in domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, she's located in San Diego, California. She has experience in the family court system, advocating for survivors, teaching other lawyers how to educate themselves on trauma-informed tactics and self-care. She now works in civil litigation where she takes her skills to the trial level. And in her spare time, she sits on the advocacy committee of the Humane Society and has three rescue bulldogs. Um, and our third panelist is Myrna McCollum. Uh, Myrna is a Métis Cree lawyer. Uh, she's a change maker and she is a passionate promoter of trauma informed lawyering. Um, Anyone who's been in any of my classes has probably been assigned at least one episode of her podcast, the Trauma Informed Lawyer podcast. And she's also one of the co-authors of a forthcoming book, The Trauma In or Trauma Informed Law, A Primer for Lawyer Resilience and Healing. And so we are just super happy to have this really incredible group of people here to talk about this really important topic as it relates to um, legal education and lawyering. Um, so with that, I am going to start by asking uh, the first question to Myrna. Um, Myrna, you know, how do you define trauma and how does it show up in legal systems? Okay. Easy question. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Folks who are attending this session have to forgive me. My video is like wonky as I said to everyone I'm in, uh, I'm on the island of Maui today and there's a windstorm. So everything is like, it's just tech wise wonky. Um, so I might have to turn off my, vid my video from time to time, but I'm still present. Um, okay, so trauma, what is it? How do I define it? Keeping in mind, I'm just a lowly lawyer. 
Uh, I have no background in social work or psychology. How I understand trauma is really what I learned through the practice of law and also reading a little bit um, from, you know, reading folks like Gabor Mate, Peter Levine, Russell van der Kolk, um, Thomas Hubel, um, lots of those folks. Um, so trauma, from what I understand, is a couple of things. One is it's it's should be separated from an event that is traumatic or traumatizing. So uh, an event, the event, right? The big thing, the little thing, the thing that has happened is usually the traumatic event. Um, that is not trauma. Trauma is the pain, horror, and fear that continues to be carried forward through life or into life or into you know, people's existence modifies and changes the way they see the world, the way they communicate, the way they behave, the way they remember, the way their brain works as a result of that traumatic experience. Um, but what I want to say, and so being really clear, it's the thing that people are living with. That's the trauma, the thing that they live with. Um, but what I want to also say is, you know, Gabor Mate has said that Trauma isn't like the traumatic experience that folks have isn't always like a thing that happens like a big event or a little event like a car crash or poverty or I mean the list is long a whole range of traumas people go through. Sometimes it's also the thing that didn't happen but should have happened. And I mean we can think about childhood for example. The care we didn't get but should have gotten, the love we should have uh, received but didn't get, the attention, the affection, the protection. Um, and, you know, if we think about adults working in unsafe, um, you know, work environments, um, you know, being free from bullying, harassment, racism, sexism, misogyny, those kinds of things. When you have a supervisor who actually doesn't take action when you report, that could be a, um, that could result in a trauma for people. So, so that's how I understand it, Natalie. And I'm sure maybe in the room. Folks will correct me. Like I said, I'm just a lowly lawyer. You're so much more than just a lowly lawyer. But thank you so much for that. Um, all right. So I, I'll put the next question to Kate. And I believe when we talked, you described yourself as being a law adjacent professor professional. Um, and uh, meaning that you're not a lawyer, but you work very closely with people involved in legal systems. So I'm curious, you know, what are your observations about how the law interacts with people who have trauma histories? Yeah, thank you. And and Marina, thank you for setting up that discussion of trauma. I really appreciate um, the way that you kind of uh, shaped it and named it off the bat as being so much bigger than what we think about. Um, and I'll say my, my adult life basically has been, um, engaging in different spaces around criminalized survival. And so the folks that I work with, my community, um, are folks that exist on both sides of, of the law. And especially the, the space where I'm mostly drawing from and, and, um, thinking about in terms of this conversation is especially when it comes to criminal law and anti-violence work. Um, and so when folks are engaged in criminalized survival, and, and that means sex work, yes, but that also means just the different criminalized ways that we cope, such as drug use, um, such as trespassing when you're homeless, those kind of uh, experiences. Um, I'm drawing on the, the, the community that lives on both sides, who are most likely to be victimized and are also always going to be seen as criminals by the system. And I think that when the legal system really interacts with people with trauma histories, they miss what Myrna just said. And, you know, when we're especially focused on these individual moments of harm, these individual moments of interpersonal harm, the law doesn't really know what to do outside of that experience. And the law in that experience is very much about a victim and a perpetrator. And it needs to be really clear what side people are on. It needs to be clear who, who is the perpetrator and who is the victim. And you have to show up in that role because that's what the law knows how to do. But when it comes to trauma histories, very often when people are sitting in a court on either side of that, that is the latest, maybe not even the latest, in a long line of different forms of trauma. And one of the things that the law doesn't really do a great job of is dealing with people who have histories and are continuing to experience state violence and cultural violence and historical violence and um, 
um, systemic harm. And what the law ends up really doing and, when, and, and engaging with the law often just re-entrenches a lot of these forms of violence. They re-entrench these forms of power dynamics and these hierarchies where folks are generally sitting on the bottom experiencing harm over and over and over. And so a lot of what legal systems end up doing is, is um, uh, re-traumatizing people and implementing new kinds of trauma and new kinds of violence when people are going through these systems. Um, and so I would say first and foremost, the the, the system and the legal system is a traumatic system, um, especially because it really can't understand these different forms of harm and violence and different ways that trauma shows up for people. Um, and then I think the other thing that often, because we have these victim perpetrator narratives, and especially because we rely so much on um, the perfect victim paradigm or the, or the pathetic victim paradigm, is that it takes people's trauma and it tries to use that to pathologize them into a victim status. And it tries to take away people's agency and, and say, um, you know, as a victim, the less agency you have, the better of a case you're gonna have, the better of a victim you're gonna come across. And so I think the other thing that it does is it takes trauma histories and really tries to um, make them in service to the court and make them in service to the law, as opposed to making them in service to someone's healing and an understanding of what justice could look like for that person. So I think those are, are kind of the two things that I see most for my community and my folks when we're um, engaging, whether it's showing up as court support because someone got busted or showing up as court support because someone decided to go that route to um, find their process of healing. Yeah, thank you so much Kate um you know I see some of my students on here in our child protection clinic where we represent parents and relatives in the child welfare system I feel like so much of what you just said really rings true for what we see and experience and you know representing our clients so um so thank you um all right and so now I'll move on and ask one for Hannah um you know and Hannah so I'm curious when you're working as a lawyer representing people who are interacting with the legal system because they're experiencing a potentially traumatic event, um, what barriers have you encountered in supporting and advocating for your clients? And then I guess as a second part, you know, and what has helped you overcome those barriers in your representation? Yeah, thank you, Natalie. And just as a quick disclaimer, I do have a puppy and this is about the time she gets a little rambunctious. So if you catch me looking off, it's not, I'm, I'm very engaged in this conversation. Um, and thank you, Mirna and Kate and Natalie and Scott again for just setting up this great conversation. I think there's a lot of barriers that um, that occur in the legal system and in the lawyer client role. Um, one is, is your own ego, um, and breaking down, um, trauma-informed lawyering is you have to stay, um, humble enough to continue your own personal education in order to be the best advocate you can for your client. Um, and what that looks like is, um, personally for me, continuing to educate myself, continuing to let my clients know that I, I don't know what's best in their situation, specifically for domestic violence clients um, is, is where most of my experience is that I don't know what's best or what's safest for them in, in, in their situation. And unless you have been in that specific situation with that specific um, partner, that perpetrator, you don't know what's best or what's safest either. Um, so that's that's one barrier I see myself. Um, the second is the judgment that we as attorneys put on things. Um, we're very quick in the legal system to we we want to win. We want to get things right. Um, and so one of those things is I I heard a lot of bosses say, well, it isn't that bad. And I think we really, we, we cause a lot of harm to clients and to our own trauma and to just the, the repetition of reinforcing that by saying that isn't that bad when really what we truly possibly might mean is that the value of the damages in certain cases. So we want to reframe that different language instead of reiterating, well, it wasn't that bad. Those are two completely different 
um, topics that we're talking about. And then the third is, well, I mean, there's multiple, but the third that I'll bring up off the top of my head that I think is the most um, notorious is, um, is really just the lack of client-centered care. All of us are carrying around trauma on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and really it takes you meeting your client where you're at, and judges don't know that, and it's your job as an advocate, as a legal advocate, to, to speak on your client's behalf for that. <clears throat> so I think that those are the biggest barriers that that um, that I see in 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 my practice and and personally, kind of what I do to um, to combat that is this kind of continued continued education on my own part, um, and then also um, when I am when I am in court, truly advocating for my client. Um, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get objected to, but you need to do things like making that record for the court, you know, you need to get, you need to um, ensure specifically speaking in, in domestic violence cases, um, the court is going to view that as either domestic violence plan, Winnie, sweetie, um, this domestic violence plan is either going to get granted or not. That's the end of the case for this court, right? Well, for your client, it's not. It's the most dangerous time of their life, right? So we want to incorporate safety planning, you know? Um, where is your client going to go? Um, you know, is your client still on, on the abuser's um, cell phone plan? You know, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about um, the trauma that you just re, you know, reinstated while trying to get all of these details, sweet friend. trying to get all these details um, out of your client in order to write these pleadings. Um, so, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of boundaries there. The legal system is full of them. I think you know Kate talked about that. So, thank you. And now I just want to give a second to let any of any one of our panelists respond to something that resonated or something. Um, that you know came up in listening to each other speak. You don't have any. All right. Um, so, uh, and we'll we'll pause it a couple times throughout just to like you know build on the conversation. If there's something that pops in your head, and if there's not. If there isn't something, that's great too. Um, so now I want each one of our panelists to answer this question, uh, maybe starting with Kate. Um, so you know, the idea of trauma-informed practice means different things to different people. Uh, and you know, we have three people here, all who you know study or engage in trauma-informed work. I'm curious, in your opinion or experience, like what are the hallmarks of trauma-informed practice? Um, I'm so excited to hear what uh, the other two have to say. And I think for me, the first thing that I'm going to put out there is that I think um, I'm a harm reductionist. Uh, harm reductionist is meeting folks where they are and not leaving them there. Um, it means that people get to assess what is harmful in their lives and you get to go in and support people to trying to reduce that harm without necessarily ending the behavior. Um, and why that matters and why I'm, I'm sharing that is because I think one of the cornerstones for me of a trauma-informed lawyer and a trauma-informed practice is understanding that the system is traumatic, understanding that the system replicates and recreates state violence on a regular basis. It is incredibly traumatic, um, you know, as Hannah was talking about, it, disclosing those details over and over again, having to share them, having to share them in a certain way, having to just go through this over and over and then have horrible questions, be cross-examined, be doubted, um, be told you're not wearing the right thing, having horrible language use. I think trauma-informed practice for any care professional, uh, in addition to a thousand other things, means that you are a harm reductionist for the violence of the system. Um, and trauma-informed lawyering is understanding that, that we're asking people um, to go through what is going to be a really painful process and it's going to be really difficult the whole time. 
And ultimately the answer that they get out of this system, as Hannah was just saying, like that court order comes down, that's what you were hoping for. And your life still has to go on and it's about to get scarier for a lot of people. So understanding that the engagement with the system is gonna be a painful process. And that one of your most important roles is understanding what the system is like, preparing your clients for what that is, being really transparent that, you know, you can't promise them the moon, but that's not even it. Being really transparent about what they might um, be asked to do, be really transparent about what is a likely outcome and be there to try to understand that that harm is coming down and your role is to be that buffer. And, and that is true in criminal law, that is true in family court, that is definitely true in administrative court. Like I had one person tell me, you have never applied for benefits if you've never cried trying to get food stamps. It's hard. And so being that professional and being that care professional is about being that intermediary that supports people going through a system with honesty and with transparency and with accountability when, um, when things happen. Thank you. And Myrna, um, we'll put that question over to you. You know, in what in your experience, you know, what are the hallmarks of trauma informed practice? Well, um, <clears throat> I mean, I was, I'm reflecting on what Kate said about like, I think lawyers, um, at least I know I I did and I would kind of like hesitate back up a little bit when I hear care and support. Why? Because we're not trained to be care providers or support providers. I think a lot of lawyers don't even consider themselves as care providers or support providers. I mean, I certainly don't. I wouldn't try to do it because I think I'd probably fail at it um, as like, you know, evidenced by my adult children who tell me pretty regularly <laughs> just how like difficult I am to communicate with sometimes. Um, so, I mean, what what I think is essential like there's lots of different components for me as an indigenous woman um, to like to the trauma informed lawyer framework that I operate from and that I've designed that is really like built upon what Sarah Katz and Dia Halter offered us in their article, The Pedagogy of Trauma Informed Lawyering. Um, but what I want to say is however lawyers want to define it, however they see it fits for them, I think what is really critical and essential is that. We can't be really effective in recognizing harm in others without first recognizing and becoming self-aware of the ways in which we are harmed. Because if we are harmed, we are bringing harm to others. And we're doing it in often an unconscious way, but often other times often in a very intentional way. And I really think that there are many lawyers who, like me, intentionally came into the practice of law because of its dehumanizing aspects. It was a very um, attractive and desirable for those of us who either felt uncomfortable working with people or were really afraid of people or were really afraid of emotion or just had problems connecting but were really um, drawn to being analytical and arguing and you know like just being in our heads a lot and I mean it's great that we have a lot of smart lawyers in the world the problem is start up intelligence as as highly or as equally as we uphold um you know iq and analytical ability and all of those things because what i've come to understand in my 16 years of practice or so is that people just want to be seen and they want to be heard and regardless of whatever their outcome is oftentimes it's the experience they have with their lawyer is is their sole takeaway from the entire like being navigated through really um, harmful legal processes and if we are committed to seeing people and hearing people we need to work on ourselves to you know see where we cause harm um, why we cause harm that way and how and to do better and that requires a self-awareness practice, a self-regulation practice, a self-critique practice, a self-reflection practice. Like, what did I learn? Um, how was I triggered? How do I manage my triggers as I navigate processes and work with difficult or work in difficult or complex situations? And uh, how do I hold space for people? 
Like these are the things that we need to learn going forward, especially in this day and age where people talk about AI a lot. Pretty soon, you know, like lawyers will be replaced by AI, but the thing AI won't be able to do is give folks that experience of being seen and being heard. And so if more lawyers were to reflect on their own internal work that they need to do and um, cultivate a little patience and empathy, and compassion and learn how to hold space for the traumas of others and learn how to hold space for themselves, then we find our, ourselves on a pathway to trauma-informed lawyering, however we find that. Yeah, thank you. And so Hannah, how about you? How, how do you define trauma-informed practice? Yeah, thank you. Um, really, I don't think that there's much that I can add that hasn't already been said, um, you know, and as goofy as it sounds, I think it's truly compassion um, for me. And if similar to Mirna, if you had asked me that in my first year of law school, I was very um attracted to the discipline and the rigor that comes with being an attorney and in in law school but now I truly find it's the the compassion the self-reflection and um I I'm in trial right now and I share this um the judge um continues to tell us and the opposing party um something along the lines of see it's it's so easy if you just um show the other side what you're thinking how much can be accomplished and it's it's you know if we just show another person you know what we're thinking and just communicate with with our hearts instead of our brains i think i think that that's what trauma informed lawyering means to me okay Thank you for all of these, you know, different approaches. And as I'm thinking about, you know, our audience, primary, primarily law students, it's a lot that is being, that is coming to you. A lot of things that we're saying you should or could do, or it's defined in different ways. And, you know, one thing I'd love to add is that for me, part of it is about taking a strengths-based approach to your clients and to yourselves and not letting, you know, perfect be the enemy of the good here. And so of the things that you have heard or are hearing, like what things are you already doing and what things can you do more of? Because there's never like the moment where you arrive and all of a sudden you just are this trauma informed person practitioner. Like it is like a, a set of skills that you develop and you grow and you continue to hone. Um, but, you know, if, if a lot of this is feeling new and like things that you haven't previously been taught in law school, um, that's like a failing of legal education that you haven't been taught that. And if, um, you know, the, you know, I, I know some of you law students tend to have perfectionist tendencies and this isn't a place where you ever could be perfect. So it's just, what can you do and how can you do a little bit more? And, um, you know, it's, it's a skill to grow. So I am going to come back to Hannah because, uh, you know, Hannah, so you're a lawyer, I think, you know, maybe I think I believe you said two years in into practice. And so, you know, we have a lot of two L's and three L's on the screen who very soon will will be new lawyers. What um, what do new lawyers need to be prepared for? Uh, what, you know, do you wish you had known when you were in law school that you know that you know now that's so exciting first of all congratulations um <clears throat> wow i feel like i could talk for days on this subject um, because i truly felt like i was so misinformed when i was um finishing law school and heading out into the real world um First of all, your grades really don't matter that much unless you're going for, you know, some kind of big law job. Um, and neither, you know, does, I mean, I guess I probably shouldn't say that to law review, but I was on law review too, and I ended up fine. So, <laughs> um, no, but um, in, in serious terms, 
um, I, a part of trauma informed um, lawyering that um, that I've actually been discussing a lot lately because I have a lot of um, colleagues and friends that are currently still in law school is that a lot of it comes from being an advocate for yourself. Um, there is, how do I put this like nicely? Um, there is absolutely no reason that you should be working 12 hour days getting paid, you know, um, I'll speak in California terms, what is a not appropriate salary for California terms. I don't know what is a not appropriate salary over there just because I mean cost of living here is crazy. Um, you know, there's no reason why you should be getting be working 12 hour days as a first year attorney getting paid, you know, $60,000. Um, and getting sworn at, um, you know, talked down to, not feeling like you're growing, um, not being trusted with work, you know, um, things like that. I've had employers um, log on remotely to my computer to check my work. Um, not a, it's not appropriate. It's controlling. It's abusive. It is toxic. Um, and to be that advocate for yourself to say, hold up, something is not right here. I'm not feeling content. I'm not feeling, you know, good and positive about myself. You know, how can you be a good trauma informed, helpful, um, positive, loving, kind attorney, when you do not feel those things yourself, when you are not fed those things, when you are not, you know, it's like a plant. If you're, if you're fed good water and sunshine and nourishment, you're going to grow into this beautiful plant. Well, you can't do that if you're treated like absolute dog poop. And I think there's this really bad stigma that we're hopefully growing away from of getting new attorneys out and treating them like that. Um, at least here, there's a big shift after the pandemic of changing and treating people more positively and giving them more pay and, um, and, and better hours. And so after I got a couple of, you know, I switched jobs quite a bit in my first year because I was just like, this is not, you know, um, appropriate or professional to be talked to or treated like this. And I doesn't make me feel good about myself. Um, and then finally landed at some place where it does nourish me and help me grow like that. So I think that that's like my really big advice. Once you guys, um, do pass the bar, um, is to be an advocate for yourself and in, in your workplace like that, um, truly. And if you, if you ever would like any resume, um, tips or advice or um, nego negotiation or con counter offering. Sorry, I've been in trial for like almost two weeks now. I'm exhausted. Counter offering, please feel free to find me on LinkedIn and talk to me about that. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you um, for sharing that. And um, yeah, I mean, you're right. You never should have had those experiences, um, which you know, as I've thought a lot about trauma-informed lawyering, and for me, it really started in making sure, thinking, focusing on how I was showing up for other other people, how I was showing up for my clients, how I was showing up with the students that I was supervising as they were representing clients. And kind of the last piece to fall into place for me was the kind of boundaries and the, the self-care piece. And, you know, Myrna, you have been, I mean, such an inspiration and like a champion on this issue. And I know it's something you speak on a lot. You've had a great episode on your podcast, but, you know, for the you know group here tonight, what advice do you have for new lawyers about establishing boundaries? Um, what should they be keyed into? Great question. Um, boundaries. I mean, figure out what they are. Figure out your own boundaries. Identify them. That's not good enough. Identify them and communicate them and then hold the line because people, as soon as you say this is my no-go zone, you're going to find people who are going to stomp all over that. And um, I also think that in in the profession, whether you're a new lawyer starting out or you're a longtime lawyer, 
people will constantly be asking you, demanding of you, expecting of you to have no boundary, to say yes, 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 sure, it can be hard, yes, or yes, it can stay late, yes, I can come in on Christmas Day, yes, I can do this, yes, 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 I can stay in try trial and still be on my feet, like, at 10 o'clock at night, let's just keep going, yes, 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 people want to hear that, and Every time you say yes, but you're feeling no, like uh, it's going to just break you down every time that happens. And I think without boundaries, we're on a fast track to burnout. We become super cynical. We become harmed in some way. We become sick in some way. We become exhausted. Uh, it's like, I don't know that, I don't know one good thing that comes from having zero boundaries. And I really think, and I really wish all, all law schools would have like boundaries 101, like teach that as a course and talk about like, no is a full sentence and get really comfortable with saying no and get really comfortable with hearing no because it's both sides of the coin, right? Like I know for me, I have a hard time saying no, so I have to practice it. And I usually practice it at the local 7-Eleven down the street from my place. So when I have to go get gas and don't hate me, I don't have like an electric car just yet. So I have to go get fuel. And when I go get fuel, I intentionally go into the gas station because I know they're going to try to upsell me with taquitos, lotto tickets. Like, do you want taquitos with fuel? No, I do not. So it's a really good, simple exercise for me to learn how to say no, because I'm, I'm, I've, I was, I think raised to be very accommodating and put myself last hell not even put myself last like I'm not even on the playing board you know what I mean and so so I do that as an exercise I try to do it like every time I need to go get fuel and um but also on the flip side I have a problem hearing no because I start to like tell myself stories about like if you're saying no to me you must not like me you must not respect me you not, must not like always comes back to my sense of self-worth or value or whatever it is. And it's like a thing in my head. And so I have to get accustomed to hearing no and knowing that that's just not, never about me. When I hear no from someone, it's because they have no capacity to give that has nothing to do with me. They have like limits or rules or whatever it may be. So now, you know, I'm in a time in my life where I fly a ton and, um, I buy carbon offsets, um, but I fly a ton and uh, I will intentionally go to the to the flight desk and say, are you giving away like free upgrades into business class today? I know they're not, but it's an opportunity for me to, to hear uh, no. <laughs> okay, no problem. And then I walk away. And I know it's a silly little exercise, but for somebody like me who has a real... Um, difficult relationship with the word no I intentionally have to seek out these opportunities to hear it and to say it and know that none, none of that has to do with and or is a statement on my value my worth my whatever and um you know so for those of you who are in this room thinking about boundaries and uh becoming comfortable with like hearing no saying no um you know in the places that you occupy in in workplaces there should be conversations when you do lunch and learns, when you bring in speakers, let's talk about boundaries. Let's talk about our relationship to the word no. What kind of stories do we tell ourselves when we hear no or when we say no? What 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 is like, we need to do a deep dive into that. And I also want to just finally say in this whole conversation around boundaries and saying no, I also get that there are certain points in life where we are surviving. We're in survival mode. At least I know when I was in law school, I was in straight up survival mode. No boundaries. I'm barely sleeping. I'm working a ton. I'm going to school full time. I'm raising three little kids by myself. Like there were no boundaries. I was trying to survive, trying to get through, trying to succeed. That's totally cool. When we have small segments of our life where boundaries go out the window because we're just trying to get through something really difficult. The only thing I want to say about that is that can't become a lifelong practice because it will drain you and it will burn you out and it will damage you and it will damage everyone around you. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. And as we're, you know, talking to law students, I can 
hear some of the things that law students have said to me just about like how you know these conversations about boundaries are really important and at times it feels like in law school you are taught the opposite of what you're hearing here tonight and like that might even be confusing and like feel funny to hear on this panel us be like set boundaries it's really important and then have every single one of your professors have like super unrealistic expectations that are like systemic and structural and in, in, structural and like institutional in in nature and so I want to put that out there um if you are having any sort of you know conflicting thoughts or feelings listening to that and then to take this a little bit deeper um you know there's a lot of times that there's words related to burnout and secondary trauma and compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma that like all get used interchangeably and um I am curious Kate if you wouldn't mind help us pull apart two two concepts that sometimes get get put together um you know this idea of vicarious trauma and how that might show up for lawyers um or for people who are working with um people who have experienced potentially traumatic events and then also like the difference of that and burnout and like why it's important to distinguish between the two. Um, that's so, so important. Um, and I just really appreciate the wealth of like what's been said. And if I could just add on to just the slightest bit about boundaries. Also, it is probably counterintuitive, but figuring out how to talk to your clients and get the information you need while also respecting their boundaries is so deeply important. And it's like an art form sometimes. But there's a difference between sitting there and like pressuring someone to just pour out everything and saying, this is why I need this information. This is what we're trying to do and making sure that people feel like they're a partner in this. They're not being acted upon. Like experiences of trauma and violence are about violations of boundaries and violations of autonomy. And it can be really traumatic to sit in front of someone who is not respecting your statement of like, I cannot go there right now. And so it's really important. Like, and that also begins with respecting your own boundaries and valuing your own boundaries. Like shit rolls downhill. And if you're not starting from a place that is respectful, that honors autonomy, that honors self-determination, that's not going to be what you're creating for your clients because you're not living in it. And we actually can't, I, I believe in fractals. I believe that the interpersonal dynamics, the internal dynamics reflect out and reflect bigger. And so everything we're talking about really does have to begin internally if we're going to be um, respectful. Um, and the question between vicarious trauma and, and burnout is super important. And, and I think the first thing I wanna say is the reason why it's important is because you deal with them in very different ways. And if you don't know the difference between what you're experiencing, you're just going to be kind of throwing shit at a wall and hoping it sticks as opposed to understanding what's going on and how to address it. And so, you know, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, it's hard doing this work. It is really hard to sit with people um, and, and writing down affidavits and, and knowing that you have to ask people to be just disclosing sometimes horrible things that have happened to them and details about it and details that they don't want to share and watching people break down that is painful that is painful emotional labor that i it, that does need to be handled and it needs to be handled with knowing yourself knowing how trauma shows up in your body knowing how triggers show up in your body being very aware of what that feels like and then being aware of how you address that it, what can you do to hold space for your own trauma and for what is coming up based on what is going on in front of you. And, and those are, are both structural and they're internal. It's, inter it's, it's internal because you have to know yourself. And what everyone was just saying is so important is, you know, burnout and being set up structurally to burn out, that takes a different set of interventions and, and it's really important to be able to advocate for yourself. If you have just back-to-back -back affidavits where you are working that, that 12 hour day and you do have those unbelievable caseloads where you can't take, you, you don't have time for therapy, who can give up that hour? Then 
you're going to be moving towards burnout. You're probably going to be experiencing vicarious trauma. You're probably not going to be able to differentiate the two. You're probably not going to make the structural changes that you need. And it's going to impact your client. It's going to impact you. And it's, as everyone has been saying, it is not, um, it, it is not serving anyone when we're going through these things and we're not recognizing these, these experiences for what they are. And I think part of it, you know, it, it comes from that, that desire for perfection, that desire to do the thing, to work the system. And also, you know, when we talk about trauma, it very often is divorced from resilience and from, as I was saying, strengths-based approaches. And so, especially if we're only talking about trauma as this thing that weakens people, then it's going to be really hard for us to accept that we are traumatized by the situations that we are put in. And that is 100% ego and not real. And so I think, you know, looking at secondary trauma and vicarious trauma, knowing yourself, knowing your triggers, knowing your limits, and knowing what that feels like in your body and being able to address that and handle that in the way. And making sure you're advocating for yourself for a realistic space at work where you can be at your best, where you feel supported, that's the other piece of that. And being able to differentiate the two means that you know how to address them. Um, because I think one of the other things about this, um, and I'm, I'm actually really curious what, um, especially you know, hearing that, that uh, other people don't need to, to think about lawyering as care labor, I always think it's really important to say soft. And, and what that means is that we can't address our, we can't address secondary trauma, we can't address burnout by becoming hard. And the thing is our clients deserve better than that. They, they deserve someone who still feels empathy, who still cares, who can still read someone and what they're going through emotionally and, and show up. And I'm not sure, you know, especially being the non-lawyer on the panel, I don't know how that lands for anyone. Um, and because it came out of a conversation where uh, we were talking about um, criminalized pregnancy. So we were talking about pregnant and parenting people who are substance users who are trying to access, uh, access reproductive justice. Um, and all of us were saying, we're talking about how we handle this. And across the board, the answer was, you know, I deal with it my own ways. I, I get therapy. I, I deal with things when they come up because the most important thing is to stay soft. And all of us, of course, like cried at the end of the conversation. Um, but I think it's really important. Like, do what you need to do. Advocate for yourself. Know yourself. Because at the end of the day, I think we're just all better served if the answer is not for us to be hard and cold. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Um, and you know, something I've been thinking about when listening, uh, and we will have like this conversation will turn a little bit hopeful in a minute. Um, but you know, one, so I write about vicarious trauma. I've had, you know, stuff out there, I talk about it. And when I do so, I always am like a little bit worried that it might come off as like pathologizing the the problem of trauma and like making the problem my clients and their bad experiences uh, when like, yes, I am impacted and like feel pain when I see them in pain or when I read about, you know, bad things, but it's not just the answer to like avoid it or to, you know, think that like, well, I can just get out of the situations where I'm exposed to trauma and things are going to get better. Um, and while lawyering can be can be tough and can be challenging, um, there's also a lot of hope and a lot of fulfillment in this work. And so I want to ask this ultimately to to everyone. I want to you know start with Hannah. Um, what brings you hope within this this work? That's a great question. I think that the thing that brings me hope is to see just the change among other lawyers um, and also the growth in the bar associations, um, you know, continued MCLEs, more MCLEs popping up on the topics and then um, change in really, truly change in, in other lawyers. You know, my um, my boss, uh, the partner of my law firm, he is, he's been practicing since 1979. So he has got to be, I mean, he is up there and he is, you know, he's a white man and, um, he is very quick to, um, 
cut, cut clients off, to drop clients, you know, anytime there's conflict, anytime a client doesn't follow through on anything, on, on anything, and to be able to teach him and tell him, you know, well, hey, let's look at, you know, let's look at this. Is it possible? I always like posing the question, is it possible that this client may have reacted this way and then this happened, you know, and, and to watch him kind of say, well, yeah, I didn't think about that, you know, and so to, to just watch people learn is, is, is really what gives me hope. Thanks. And, you know, Myrna, you've had, you know, many, many conversations with people uh, that have been, you know, shared all around the world about, um, about trauma and trauma-informed lawyering. And, you know, so I'm curious, you know, for you, what, what brings you hope in, you know, work regarding trauma? Uh, well, I'm going to say what gives me hope is law students. Law students give me hope. I show up for law students all the time. Um, and yeah, usually when I get called in, I find a way to make it happen to present to them, but they give me hope. Um, I'm hearing more and more of them demand, um, you know, to, to demand from their law professors that they be taught the law in a trauma informed way, um, demand that law professors learn about trauma, um, and create trauma informed curriculum, um, that they understand uh, that law professors, legal educators start to commit to understand that people bring their lived experiences to law school. And you can't talk about certain cases in a classroom without acknowledging and reflecting that you could be talking about somebody's lived experience in that room or somebody's family in that room. And so like, I love that they are showing up and demanding trauma-informed education. And as they go into the practice of law, I hear these law students who become lawyers um, talk about and demand um, that space be made for mental health and wellness. Like these next generations of lawyers are no longer going to be of the pull up your bootstraps, grow a thick skin mindset. Like I'm going to work till I heart attack out and die. Like they are not of that mindset. They are like, nope, I'm going to work really hard. And then I'm going to like hang out with my family. And then I'm going to um, take some time off to volunteer, to do things that I really enjoy and, and help that fuel my work so that my work is enjoyable. Like they talk about creating pathways through the legal profession that is meaningful, purposeful, but also joyful. And you don't often hear lawyers talk about their legal careers as joyful. And so the more joy we have, the more joyful lawyers we have, or like mentally, um, like, I don't want to say mentally well, but the more committed they are to mental health and wellness, it all trickles down and trickles out. These people will become judges and everyone that these lawyers encounter, um, you know, are going to be better off for a healed and restored and a well lawyer. And so it's law students. Love them. Yeah, thank you, Myrna. Um, Kate. Uh, you know, in, in your work, what, what brings you hope? Um, I think the thing similarly, it's that it feels like the people are shifting. And I think, especially, you know, from my perspective, being legal adjacent, um, I feel like more and more lawyers are excited to question the system and to work with communities to change it. Um, it's not just, hey, I'm a practitioner of the system and I am in service to the system. I genuinely feel like more and more um, there's lawyers and law students and people who are working in the legal system who are saying, uh, who are demanding change, demanding better treatment for clients, um, better understanding of their role in these power dynamics. Um, and that is that I think is really transformative um, and, and really exciting to feel like it's uh, it's more comrades in the fight. 
Yeah, thank you all so much. And I, you know, just I'm hearing the the changing of people who you thought might not ever change, and then really the the next generation coming through that is demanding more. And I'm like, you know, looking at names on the screen and thinking about how many of my students have also really been my teachers in that regard. And you know, I just view law students as as change makers. Um, you know, one other kind of, and this isn't like a question I said I was going to ask, but I want to put it out there because I think it's a imp really important part of the conversation. But so, you know, when I think about trauma-informed lawyering, one thing I think about is having, you know, relationships that are collaborative and mutual and, you know, empowering clients. So, you know, collaboration, mutuality, some of that opens us up to some of that vicarious trauma where one's, someone's trauma really can impact us. There's also really exciting research and, you know, stuff coming out about, you know, post-traumatic growth and then vicarious resilience. And so, you know, it's not all in how like it can really add depth to your life in representing and working in collaboration with people who are experiencing adversity and, you know, still carrying on. Um, I'm curious, you know, for any any one of you here on the screen, is does any of that resonate or show up in in your work? Okay, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I'm gonna say, of course, of course it does, which is why I often talk to people about vicarious resilience. Like just as we become witnesses to the traumas of others, we also become witness to their resilience. And just by simply working with them and witnessing, we can learn all of those characteristics. We can learn about all those qualities. We can cultivate it in and of it in ourselves and recognize that if they can continue to show up, if they can continue to fight, if they can continue to not lose hope, well, then so can we. And, you know, resilience is, um, some people I know it's like a trigger word for them, but I also, you know, think that we all have strengths and individually and organizationally, we need to make space for exploring what those are in the form of what I like to call organizational resilience. Like, how do we cultivate this? How do we hold on to this? How do we like promote it so it's out everywhere? Kate, any thoughts? Um, first off, that I love the term vicarious resilience. I haven't heard that. Um, and and honestly, I don't know how you can't not. I mean, I I get to work with sex workers all the time. Like that's my my trajectory. That's my community. That's my folks. Um, and the thing is, like. When you work with folks who are experiencing and living through criminalized survival, that is, those are people that are so committed to life that they are willing to go up against the legal system to live. That means that for sex workers, every single day you wake up and you are like, I am not going to be beat down by poverty. I am going to make money in the way that is possible for me. When you're talking about trans folks and especially trans youth you're talking about people who are so sure about their identity and so committed to living their life that they're experiencing a wave of of the most horrible laws we've seen in years about gender identity for people who want access to abortion for people who want access to emotional healing healing and physical healing and so they're substance users when we're talking about criminalized survival we're talking about people who wake up every single day and say fuck the system Whatever happens to me happens to me, but I am that committed to showing up to living every single day. And I don't know how, I don't know how to work with folks and not be inspired and find joy at the root of that, even if we spend all of our time talking about harm. Thank you. Uh, Hannah, how about you? Yeah, um, I'd say uh, very similar to uh, what's already been said. Um, it's, 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 you know, these are wor working with people who have experienced very severe trauma and also experienced 
you, you know, have this very, very um, strong sense of if, if, if they choose to call it resiliency, um, it's it's very, it's almost, you know, impossible not to, sorry, my dogs, it's a crazy time right now. At, it's like six o'clock hits and it's wild, you know, WWE time. Um, it's it's hard not to experience that vicarious resiliency. And, and, and that's how I also get, you know, fed is is that I that I see this occurring and and oh, it's, um it, it's just so exciting to see happen and to want to continue to support and um um yeah it just it's really exciting and you know we historically haven't done a great job at teaching lawyers how to be people who provide care and support and it doesn't mean that that's not possible and you know I found that the more that we in engage or more I engage in a trauma-informed approach, the more that it builds on itself because the better my clients and others then in turn respond to me. And it is like an upwards spiral and, you know, trying to really embody a trauma-informed approach. And I think that also can be really helpful and encouraging. And like one of the many reasons for anyone who's, you know, here listening to like dive deeper into this is it pays off. And certainly it pays off for the people you're serving, but it pays off for you too. And, you know, you don't have to be a therapist to have a relationship with someone that can be therapeutic and healing. Um, You don't have to have those skills. You just have to show up in a healing manner and that, that can help. Um, And yeah, so I'm seeing, um, Myrna's Myrna's hand up and I'm really excited with what what's coming next it's not really exciting Natalie I wish it was um what I want to say damn my computer is it's my computer it's not my video I've used multiple um cameras now so it's got to be my laptop anyway I digress um I want to say, you know, earlier I commented about how I resist. And I know that there are other lawyers who resist, like the language of care and support, because we can't identify with those concepts. But what I want to say and really convey to this community is that even though we may not not identify as care providers and support providers, I do believe that we have an ethical, moral duty obligation to ensure that as we're about to take people through a hellish, a hellish legal process that we have conversations with them about who do you have providing you with care? Who do you have supporting you? Because I'm about to take you through hell and you're gonna need community showing up to hold you, to help you. I mean, I don't do that kind of thing, but there are people who do, who specialize in it, who are trained in it. And I really urge you to like lean on them. And if not them, then your family. Um, If you hopefully have a supportive family don't but let's explore what the options are and this is you know I think another opportunity particularly for criminal uh, lawyers to be, build really good relationships with victim support offices and victim support workers because that should really be seen as a partnership like a real alliance that could help the clients that's all I wanted to say Natalie yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, it's absolutely. There's as a lawyer, you can't and won't be everything to your client, but you can know people and help your clients. I and be and just be a person who helps your client identify their people. Um, and that is a really, really important, important point. Um, okay, so I want to have some time for student questions, of which I really hope that um, there are some. Uh, but before we do that, I just also want to acknowledge that today we barely have scratched the surface on this vast and important topic. And so I'm curious after, you know, for the three panelists and we can start with Hannah, but what is something that hasn't been said here yet tonight that is really important to the conversation on trauma-informed layering? Oof. Um... There are a lot that uh, that comes in to this. Um, 
topic that that hasn't been said but there also is a lot that has been said in this one conversation and I do remember being in in school and like it has been said um coming to a panel like this while you're in school uh thank you guys so much for coming and listening to this um I think um one thing um one thing that hasn't been said, I, I, I like have like so many things going in my brain that I'm like, what would even make like sense to talk about right now? Um, there she is. Um, I think would be, um, if you a ch child, I heard there was also talk about child, um, child, um, child, um, child welfare law, child. There's something like that. And I think um sorry, one second. Yeah. Uh, I think it would be it's it's really great to um become knowledgeable about ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences. Um, and to, you know, there's there's tons of literature, there's tons of information out there. Um, and um, yeah, to inform yourself about that if you're working with children um, going through the legal system. Yeah, thank you. Kate, what what would you want to add? Or what do you want to add? Uh, I think first I want to echo the thank you. Um, you know, as someone who I, I've done a lot of work being uh, a support person for folks going through systems. I've done oh, while they're going through their court case, while they're going through the investigation of their case, during extractions when they need to leave a bad situation and possibly find legal support. And God, thank you. It makes such a difference. It really, really does when you're working with someone. Um, and so I just first want to say, just express gratitude. Um, and the other thing, and I know we talked about this and, and Myrna, actually, I love how you phrased it in, the, in our prep conversation that, um, trauma-informed lawyering and cultural humility go hand in hand and cannot be divorced from each other. Doing internal racial equity work, doing, uh, gender equity work has to be part of trauma-informed lawyering, um, especially because it will not only make you better at dealing with your clients, it will also like doing that kind of cultural humility work is a, is is humbling for a reason. And it, it em empowers you to create um, feedback loops and it, it uh, helps us build empathy. It helps us just deal with people better. And it has these big terms and, um, the if you haven't explored the racial healing handbook it's one i i deeply recommend um but understanding the cultural and historical legacies of white supremacy of heteropatriarchy and understanding the violence of those systems also means you're gonna better understand how those hierarchies are showing up with your clients and the system including in proceedings um and and so i i, I really cannot stress enough that like you know, this is about trauma from wearing and it's really important. And if you're not doing cultural humility work at the same time, um, you're going to miss deeply, deeply important things um, that uh, are impactful, both interpersonally and internally, um, as well as just understanding the system and the structures of the system a lot, uh, a lot more. I think it's it's really important for practitioners of the law to understand structural racism in the law, to understand the ways that laws and criminalization and child welfare systems and administration and benefits, mm -hmm. understanding those historical legacies of the violence of white supremacy and how it has used the law to uphold and create systems of white supremacy, is deeply, deeply important, and it is truly the other half of this conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kate. Um, Myrna? Ooh. Thank you. Okay, so I want to say trauma is an elite traveler, like it's a super traveler. It has all the gold stars. And what I mean by that is you can find it everywhere and anywhere. It's for those thinking, oh, trauma only exists in criminal law, it only exists in family law, just in immigration, nope, nope, nope. 
Trauma is everywhere. You're going to find it in m &A. You're going to find it in estates. You're going to find it in real estate transactions. You're going to find it everywhere. So I want to just reiterate that. And if we're offering suggestions about things to read, I want to say, um, please read Resma Menachem's book. Um, it's called My Grandmother's Hands. And in it, he talks a lot about trauma healing, metabolizing trauma. It's a really interesting book and a, and a unique approach. And he, you know, confronts that heavy subject of white supremacy um, and the white bodied experience. And I also want to recommend Kara Page and Erica Woodland wrote Healing Justice Lineages, Dreaming at the Crossroads of Liberation, Collective Care and Safety. And finally, I want to recommend Gabor Mate's latest book, The Myth of Normal. It talks about toxic stress. And I could tell you in the legal profession, there's no shortage of toxic stress. So if you're interested in understanding your own trauma and your own healing pathway in your own, um, you know, like how it is you're going to carve out a space for you that centers you in your safety and your empowerment before all others. I think his book is a really good place to start. And of course, when it comes out, Trauma-Informed Law Pathway uh, to Healing and Resilience for Lawyers, published by the ABA, hopefully it comes out later this month. Read it, find it, look it up. So yeah. Definitely send some, you know, when uh, that one, that one comes out, Myrna. Um, thank you for that. All right. So now we have a little bit of time left and I am super curious to hear either, you know, questions or feedback from anyone who's here listening tonight. Uh, this is, you know, this is for you. So uh, Brandy. Yeah, thanks. So I really, I like the idea of having um, someone that you can refer, like, listen, I'm not a therapist. I'm, I'm not good at this whole caring thing. Do you have like a list of trusted therapists or providers or somebody, a, a resource that you give to your clients and say, these are the people I know would be good to help you get through the situation. Like, do you have that kind of thing for them? I mean, I do. I do. And I do the research for the people because I work with people all over the place. So I figure out like who's good. I ask people on my social network, like, who do you recommend? Who offers these services? Uh, when I was a criminal lawyer, I built good relationships with victim support. That's a good place to start, like local family services, counseling agencies, crisis counseling, crisis care we have to get educated and we have to understand who's out there. And then we have to, I think, build relationships and partnerships. I think in larger law firms, maybe even in medium sized firms, I think that there should be a mental health um, therapist who lives in that office, like has their own space and comes in a couple times a week for people to just pop in and debrief with them and be a resource. And maybe even if we want to like get really courageous and daring and brave, then maybe we actually collaborate with them to prep clients and witnesses for trial and, and depositions and really hard points of law um, and give them the mental health tools, tips, tricks, self-regulations, things that they need to help navigate um, those lawyers who show up wanting to destroy them and leave them in a puddle of you know, tears in the witness box. Um, I think if we were truly committed to our clients, we would spare no expense. I mean, God knows we make enough money. Like, and I'm, I'm talking right now about like big law, right? Yeah, thank you. I love that idea. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, the value of interdisciplinary practice is something we did not really talk about tonight, but I mean, it that is a whole other wonderful thing that certainly would fall under the umbrella of trauma-informed, um, trauma-informed layering. Um, um, I just wanted to share. I, so now I definitely do, but <clears throat> also because I'm just doing peer support means that people are asking all the time for sex worker friendly 
uh, mental health care. And so just having that is really challenging. Um, but I actually used to work at an organization, it was an uh, anti-violence organization that had a, um, a counseling team as well as a legal team. So it was both sex worker focused legal and counseling services. And actually what we used to do, especially because we worked with a lot of people who had uh, TNU visas or were applying for TNU visas, but you would set up an appointment with your lawyer and then immediately after get an appointment with a counselor. And so we would literally have a, bring people in, have to go through what they need to go through to deal with uh, developing that affidavit. And um, sorry, T and U visas are both victims of violence uh, visas for people who are out of status uh, for immigration. Um, and literally the lawyer would walk that person directly over to sit with their counselor who they had known. They've been going to this person for as long as they've been within the program. Um, and it it was uh, hand in hand, Every like they were able to work together. They were able to, to support each other. The lawyer could communicate to the counselor when court dates were coming up. Um, it was a really amazing program that was about really trying to get people as holistic of support as was available. I just want to put in another um, shameless plug for um, uh, additional services that um, were talked about, um, nonprofit services like that were talked about and, and other domestic violence and sexual assault services. They, they also have, uh, you know, free um, bus passes, shower passes, um, uh, you know, things like that. Um, so I, that's always my go-to is yes, here is this, you know, list of, um, therapists, um, you know, all of mine are, um, free for, um, low income individuals, fee waiver individuals. Um, but also I like to, um, to direct people to the, um, local domestic violence nonprofit, um, just because there is that, um, it's a, it's a complete amazing group of people who do all this community networking. It's just like this, you know, flower that blossoms out into the community that can help with so many other things, you know, food, shelter, housing, um, all of those things that why would you not connect someone with those resources? Thank you. Um, other questions? I have a question. Um, so I enjoyed the whole conversation, but like what's coming back to me from it is the part about boundaries and um, particularly kind of what Hannah described a little bit with her um, entering into the legal profession as an attorney and like um, changing jobs. And I'm curious if there are any, if you have any advice for students like us who will be doing the same soon and like being able to fish out or like, I don't navigate the, um, finding a good spot. Like, you know, if there are good questions to ask, um, kind of to vet out employers, um, when we're looking and making sure that you're going to be in a spot that can respect boundaries and I don't know. Yes, I have a whole list that I've um, come up with and I'm still learning. I'm still figuring it out. My top two are, um, what would your other employees say about the work environment here? And if the answer is we are like a family, that's an immediate red flag for me personally, because they're not going to respect my boundaries. They're going to treat me like a family member and, uh, you know, just contact me 24 seven. Um, if your work is not paying for your cell phone bill, lose my number. Um, because, or pay for my cell phone bill. Um, so my current work right now. So um, if you, and then the other one is the longevity of previous employees. Um, if they're constantly having turnover, something is going on there. Um, that's a huge one. Um, but if you want, I can put my email in the chat and I can give you um, um, the most common one, the most common whatever um, that I ask so that you can kind of look at them. And then I can even give you some like red flag objections that I'm sure 
um, the other panelists have some really great ones as well, too. I mean, I don't know that I can add to that because I essentially just kind of pieced out of a lot of that and went to work for myself. Like that's because, you know, I get to make the rules. Uh, but my rules are, you know, not that great because here I am. Online, but I've been bricking every day this week. <laughs> um, but I want to say, you know, Joan put in the chat, lawyer assistance programs are a free and confidential resource for dealing with trauma and, with, and building resilience. I would think, and Joan can correct me if I'm wrong, that lawyers assistance programs, lawyers concerned for lawyers, they're not just there as a, um, a place where we go when we're reacting to breakdown. I think that they're also a resource that we can utilize to figure out how to navigate tricky situations or how to speak up for ourselves when we need support or how to identify what what kind of workplace might be a good fit for me or how do I broach the conversation of boundaries um, either at, in hiring um, interviews or um, you know wherever it may be and because um, I think they do more than just you know simply manage people after the thing has happened. Joan will tell me if I'm wrong. You are absolutely right. Thank you for that, uh, those comments about LAPS because we really, you know, we've been doing well being before anyone else had heard about it but people think that we're just the alcohol police and we're there for helping people thrive, not just recover. And I would just add, you know, reach out to your professors who know people and know reputations of firms and um, who also know kind of the channels to get help and support. Um, and People who have been around a little bit longer than than you all know the good place, some of the good places to go and some of the not so good places to go. We probably have time for about one or two more questions. Um, who else has something? Okay, I have one more question. <clears throat> and for much of the beginning of this, I was in a class, uh, so I may have missed something. But as a trauma-informed lawyer, if you yourself have PTSD, um, how, I guess, how important is it for you to stay on top of your own trauma? And, and how do you go about that? Uh, are there, because I know there are trauma therapists out there. Are there like trauma lawyer therapists out there, <laughs> you know, people who are like, oh, I get it, you're a lawyer. Um, but in, what advice do you have in that kind of arena? Okay, I'm going to just speak up because no one's hitting the unmute button <laughs> just yet. But yeah, it, like, it's kind of like surprising in a good way to see how many lawyers tur turn therapists there are. Um, and you see them on social media. I mean, my friend Doran Gold, but like, he's like East side of Canada. Uh, he's like a really well-known lawyer turned therapist. And um, Dr. Amar Dahl, he has been on my podcast um, talking about emotional intelligence and the art of living. And he and I are actually doing like a three to four day retreat in Whistler, British Columbia in April, where we're inviting lawyers from all over the world to come join us. And um we're going to talk about all of those, like all of the things that you're hearing about here today, and then some. And he is a lawyer turned therapist from Australia. So for anyone who's interested in like professional development retreats, you should go to my website and have a look at what it is that we're doing in April, because nothing like that has ever existed before. And it'll be really interesting to see how it goes. But um, yeah, all you got to do is like Google. And it's remarkable how many people are leaving the practice of law to become therapists. And uh, thank God for them, because every lawyer should have a therapist.
Yeah. So, you know, I would also add that we, it is like, well, first I actually want to normalize that we have recent data that 26% of law students is a 2021 survey. Um, 26% of law students have indicators such that they should be screened for PTSD. Um, like that is not insignificant. So if you are a law student who is ex has experienced trauma or is currently having, you know, struggling with the negative consequences of trauma, you absolutely are not alone. And like the numbers show that. And yeah, the, I've got, so Miriam Itzkowitz is our director of trauma-informed care with the Institute to Transform Child Protection. She's not a lawyer, she's a licensed social worker, but she's talked to me a lot about like how she's like kind of developed a niche and it is like a niche in working with lawyers. Cause she's like, you guys are just like a different kind of think, you have different thinking patterns and different brains and a whole other different like culture and like need therapists who have that specialization. And so um, she also is like pretty good at coming up with referral lists for, for you all, if our counseling services, you know, you need more than, than what we have to offer and finding those specialized therapists is a great thing. And like, you know, Myrna suggested there's a lot of them out there. Thank you. All right, we can either do one more question or I'll pose, or I will pose one last question to the panelists, but I wanna give anyone who's on the call um, or on the Zoom a chance for the final question. Okay. So that I just, you know, we're here with a bunch of amazing law students who were excited to, about the topic to tune in today. And I would love it if we could close with, you know, going around with just one, one piece of advice for them as they are continuing on their journey to become a trauma-informed attorney. Maybe I'll start with Kate, if, if that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, I love what Hannah just said about normalizing trauma. Um, yes, we're gonna, you're gonna have clients that have trauma and trauma histories and understanding the different forms of trauma and what causes that and understanding it yourself is really important. But at the end of the day, like trauma informed means trauma informed for everyone. It means trauma informed for you, for the folks that you work with, for your boss, for everyone around you. Trauma informed means understanding that literally every single one of us has trauma. It's not shameful. It's not anything to be embarrassed about. The more that we hide it, the harder it gets to talk about. The more that we pathologize it, the harder it gets to talk about. And every single one of us carries trauma and there's no Olympics of trauma. Everyone experiences things differently. Sometimes we experience things that traumatize us that don't traumatize others and vice versa. And that's okay too. And I think the root of this conversation really just needs to start with understanding that like every single one of us carries trauma and it is okay. And it is not anything to be ashamed about. And that's true for you as much as it's true for your clients. Thanks. Hannah? Um, yeah, I think I would just leave with be kind to yourself. Um, law school is, I mean, at least it was for me, law school is really, um, a hard place mentally for me. Um, I'll know, and I'll, uh, going back to the question before this, I'll normalize, um, seeking therapy in law school and outside of law school as, um, I almost said as an adult, but I've been an adult in both, at both times. Um, but as a lawyer, um, seeking therapy, um, for mental health, um, uh, just be kind to yourself, you know, um, it's, it's really hard to be trauma informed, um, when, when you're unable to be, um, kind to yourself and loving to yourself. Thanks, Hannah. Myrna? Okay, so, what do I want to leave you with? I want to leave you with this quote. There's a fellow who is known as the conscious lawyer. His name is Patrick Andrews. He wrote an article 
and in it he quotes, doctors still retain a high degree of public confidence because they are perceived as healers. Should lawyers not be healers, healers not warriors, healers not procurers, healers not hire guns? He quoted Warren Berger, who served as the Chief Justice U.S. Supreme Court from 1969 to 1996. But he also, Patrick goes on to say, Although it sounds almost preposterous, the idea of lawyer being a healer um, wasn't, you know, first didn't come to the fore by uh, Warren Berger. It was Robert Benham, former Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court, once noted, the first professions in society were the clergy who healed the spirit, although that wasn't the case for my people, um, the doctor who healed the body, and the lawyer who healed the community. And so... I just want to say, you know, as you all go into the world and become lawyers, we don't all have to be gladiators, like with our shields and our swords. I invite you all to think about how you can serve as a healer. How can lawyers become healers? I think it's a question and a conversation more of us need to have with each other. Thank you all so much. And um, I guess, you know, Scott, this is, you You pulled everyone together tonight. And um, so thank you for doing that. And I will uh, hand it back to you for the final, the final word. Great, well, thank you. Um, and on behalf of the Law Review, thank you all for attending. Um, thank you, Professor Netzel for moderating our panel and to Kate, Hannah, and Marina for, for your great insights um, and important um, into this important topic. So uh, thank you all and stop the recording.